Welcome and, and good morning. Um, I hope that we can continue our dialogue that we started yesterday and move forward in, I think, what is a very, very positive trajectory in discussing the issues on the Middle East. Our, we really have an opportunity, I think, to do some good, and that's what our goal is throughout this event. Um, for those who weren't here yesterday, let me walk through a little bit about how our sessions are going to operate, and also as a reminder for everyone here, um, yesterday we got a broad orientation or overview on some of the key issues in the Middle East, and, and you always have to use the word some because there are just a plethora of, of issues. And what we're going to do now is take discrete pieces of topics on the Middle East and slice those apart to get a, a, a deeper understanding. Our first session is going to be uh, the political context, focusing on governance issues, regional cooperation, and um, a very uh, um, prominent issue is, is a demographic issue in the Middle East. Um, we will take a break after the first session is over, move to the second session, which will be talking about the security context, obviously national defense, um, regional threats, but also social well-being, which also I think intimately ties into the topic of, of um, security. We will take our lunch for those, um, if you have a purple sticker here, it means you paid for lunch, and we'll actually move next door for our luncheon discussion, and we're very pleased and honored to have the Consul Generals of uh, Israel and Egypt to talk about uh, issues there. And then we'll re return to this room to finish up with the economic context on resources, globalization, and prosperity in the Middle East. Now, let me walk through how each one of our sessions will be operating. Um, our moderator will come up in a second, and her goal will be to frame the broad topic that is today, which is the political context. Uh, she will introduce our three speakers. Each speaker will have um, hopefully 12 to 15 minutes, and as I showed you yesterday, we will try to rigorously enforce that as best we can, and uh, I have to use the words as best we can. Um, after that, each one of our presenters would have brought up, uh, I am sure, some very provocative issues. We would like our panelists then, led by our moderator, to lead them into a discussion so they can interchange among themselves and follow up on some of the threads that were brought forward. We will then open it up to a question and answer uh, session from the audience. And then we will conclude with our moderator who will try to pull together some of the conclusions that were brought forward. Our ultimate goal from this is to culminate with uh, a final session in which we take the conclusions from our various panel sessions and try to define some policy recommendations that are based on consensus so that we don't keep going into the same ruts and the same discussions that we have had before on the Middle East, that we can begin the process of moving forward, whether you're liberal, whether you're conservative, whether you're pro this or anti that, our goal is to come up with conclusions and policy recommendations that everyone can embrace. Um, if successful, we would then like to follow up with our, our speakers with potentially taking those consensus recommendations and, and blowing those up into a, a fully edited book in the future so that this conference has uh, some long-lasting value for everyone. So with that, let me introduce our um, first moderator, who is uh, Dr. Ursula Munsel. Um, Ursula is not only s uh, significant in uh, the role she'll be playing right now, but she was actually one of the driving forces putting together this entire conference, and we would not have had the caliber that we have without her inspiration and uh, clearly her driving force that pulled a lot of this together. Um, just a few words about uh, um, Ursula. She has had a whirlwind existence traveling around the world, including posting in, uh, in Tel Aviv, which will be very prominent for what we're going to be talking about now. Uh, she has a PhD in history from, uh, from Germany. She teaches as an uh, adjunct at the University of St. Thomas. She is also an international consultant with a, a, a business here in Houston. She's led delegations uh, from uh, countries ar around this region, introducing them to the region as, as well as corporations. Um, her husband is a, a diplomat in, in Germany. He was former um, consul general of Germany here in Houston. 
and uh, they have had an amazing life and uh, a great deal to tell today. So with that, please let me introduce Dr. Ursula Munso. So thank you for your kind words, but I won't tell you about my, I don't know if it was so amazing <laughs> life. <laughs> I have um, distinguished panelists uh, today uh, to talk to you. And um, our topic uh, this morning is um, governance, uh, regional cooperation, and demographics. And um, let me start with the last one. I mean, the demographics, it's something we just can't ignore. And, uh, it has such a huge impact on governance and cooperation. Uh, and this is uh, the demographic pressure in the Arab world. So you, uh, the Arab world is kind of overpopulated where uh, Europe, and you have heard I'm German, is shrinking. And the Arab world has uh, what is called a youth bulge. And with all the problems which result from this high unemployment among the young people, they have, the Arab world has uh, more than 60% of the population is under the age of 25, whereas in Europe, 20% is under the age of uh, 25, and in Germany it's even lower. So we, it was just an article that we are an aging or dying, whatever, <laughs> nation. Uh, so we have the, the, the opposite problem. Um, and um, also the regional cooperation, as you see, I go the other way around. Um, at the moment, we have the impression that it's a disintegration of even the nations there and not a cooperation. But we have also heard yesterday that there is some cooperation in the region uh, by nations and states we wouldn't uh, expect it. Uh, like, um, and they are, there is an outside pressure for cooperation. Uh, this is the scarcity of resources, just to mention water and uh, <clears throat> the increasing desertification. So there, there would be many reasons, besides the political reasons, um, just to sustain the area uh, for cooperation. We will see if there is some cooperation. And then governance. And uh, yesterday, the um, Egyptian Consul General was so elucidating uh, the uh, role of a strong state and not an authoritarian state, but a state which um, is in charge of the tasks of a state to provide security, equality, uh, um, and, and so on. Um, so we will hear uh, today how this is all tied in together. And I might introduce um, the speakers uh, today. Uh, to my right, it's Alan G. Meisenheimer, and he is, um, how can I call you, seasoned veteran in the diplomatic service. And when I introduced myself to him yesterday, and I said, I belong to the same trade, and he said, my sympathy. So <laughs> um, we have something in common. And he served widely in the Arab region. He speaks Arabic. He, um, uh, graduated in international economics in Arabic from Georgetown University, and he served at the U.S. embassies in Amman, Cairo, Rabat, and Tunis. He was deputy chief of mission at the U.S. embassy in Yemen, and then later in Kuwait. Uh, 2009 and 2010, he was a political advisor to the commanding general of multinational corps in Iraq. And he was also the senior advisor on Arab Kurd issues to the US ambassador in Iraq, and he was based in Kirkuk. Um, when he served in, in Washington, he was in charge of uh, the Office of Iran Affairs, and then later the country director for Arabian Peninsula Affairs. So he covered almost every country in the region. The region. I don't know what you missed. <laughs> And uh, in 2010, he joined the faculty of the National War College. And most recently, he was appointed director of the Office of Near East and South Asia Affairs in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research at the US State Department. And I have to say, we have something else in common. I Googled you, of course, and you have a daughter named Sophia, who is 21, and so do I. 
I have a daughter named Sophia who is 21. <laughs> and 21 years ago, we were posted to Israel. And you know what 21 years ago happened in the region? It was the first Gulf War and it was a very memorable stay there. That's all what I can say. Um, so our, our next uh, speaker is uh, Nader Hashimi. He is the director of, Center of, of the Center for Middle East Studies and assistant professor of Middle East and Islamic politics at the Josef Korbel School of International Studies at the University of Denver. He was visiting professor at many universities, among them University of California, University of Toronto, and Harvard University. And he also uh, graduated from uh, University of Toronto with a PhD. Um, with a dissertation on the relationship between religion and democracy. And I think this is one of the, the key issues. This, this is, if you can give us the answer, I think we would have the answer. Buy for my book. The, yes, and I come to his book. <laughs> I won't forget this, his news book is Islam, Secularism and Liberal Democracy Toward a Democratic Theory for Muslim Societies published by Oxford University Press. So this is, uh, you, you, you have your fingers in the, in the wound, so this is how to reconcile. And I have to say, and I want to be short, um, I mean, we had to figure out, we in Europe, uh, hundreds of years ago, the same problem. How to come from a relig religiously based society in the Middle Ages to modern society and think of the French Revolution it was also a very bloody experience, and I don't want to draw too many parallels, but it didn't seem so pretty in the beginning, but it had a lasting impact, the French Revolution. So maybe we can um, hope for a similar outcome uh, of the Arab Revolution. And our last speaker is uh, Thomas Lipman, and he is an award-winning author and journalist, and he has written for three decades specializing on Saudi Arabia. He was the former Middle East Bureau Chief of the Washington Post, and he was also, and this is of interest here in Houston, the newspaper's oil and energy reporter. So we are in Houston, it's all about oil and gas. And he uh, authored six books. Uh, I don't mention them all, but one is Understanding Islam, and Arabian Night, not Nights, and with a K, Colonel Bill Eddy and the Rise of American Power in the Middle East. And his latest book, it was just published this year, is uh, called uh, Saudi Arabia on the Edge. So I think we have a very distinguished panel, and I would like uh, um, Alan Meisenheimer to start. Good morning. It's you a. Want to speak here? Would you like me to? If you like, yes. Okay. <laughs> Wherever you feel. Good morning. It's, it's a great privilege to uh, be here in Houston for the very first time and to have a chance to talk with you about issues that have uh, interested and in some ways plagued me and my family for many, many years. Every day I have the great privilege of working on a wide range of issues, uh, as we like to say, from Marrakesh to Bangladesh as the swath of the world that, that my office works on. This means that every single morning I come in and there's a crisis somewhere. Uh, that perhaps means that there's never a crisis. If every day is a crisis, then you know, no day is a crisis. When it's a crisis, we feel, on the one hand, this is bad, obviously, because it means there's a human cost and a cost in American interest being paid. On the other hand, for those of us who are in a career of service, there is no higher privilege that we aspire to than to have the opportunity to work on problems that face our country and our society, and I have that privilege every day. Now, I'm not going to talk much in these remarks about specific issues in any of the many countries that I work on and that I have worked on over the years. I'm happy to, uh, in our, our follow-on conversation, to touch on any or, or all of those that arise. What I want to share with you this morning is uh, a, a set of remarks, a, a, uh, a set of concepts, and an analytical pattern that formed itself in my mind at uh, Andrews Air Force Base a few weeks ago as we were sitting waiting for the arrival of the airplane uh, bearing the coffins with the remains of our colleagues returning from Benghazi. Many of us, as you can imagine, in the State Department have been thinking 
not only over many years, but with great intensity and specificity over recent weeks about the meaning of these events and about our policy in the region and where this whole situation is going, where it's taking us, where we are taking it. So what I'll share with you this morning are some thoughts, mostly conceptual, about our efforts to make sense of where these events have come from and where we're going with these events. I have to begin with a source of great inspiration and uh, enlightenment to me, and that is the Greek historian Thucydides, who lived in the fifth century BC and chronicled the Peloponnesian War between the Athenians and the Spartans and their many allies on both sides. The war lasted 31 years. And like all wars, for the people affected in it, of course, they thought it was the most cosmic and significant and consequential development in history. And for them, it was, because the war shaped their time and their lives. But in chronicling that war, Thucydides did not simply describe the events of the war and the conflict between Greek city-states of uh, a remote time which is no longer relevant in and of itself to us. What he did in chronicling the events of that war was to analyze war and the way humans behave under the incredible duress of conflict and also in normal times where human societies, political entities in which humans interact with each other face threats to their interest and look at the prospect of war as a possibility and face a range of decisions in how to address it. Now, in analyzing war in his time, and the reason his book still exists is because the analysis in his time is no less relevant in our time than it was in his 2,500 years ago, he discerned three specific factors that not only motivate human beings and human societies in decisions in the time of war, but in fact are the underlying motives and motiv motivational factors in all of statecraft. And as some of you, I'm sure, are aware, these three are fear, honor, and interest. When a society, when a leader is looking at a challenge, there are three factors whether you articulate them in this way or not, these are the factors that either singly or in some combination will determine the decisions that the society, the government, and ultimately the people of that country make. Fear, honor, and interest. Now, Thucydides says that when the war began between the Athenians and the, uh, and the Spartans, the main cause was fear. It was fear of the growing power of Athens that made war inevitable, he says. But in the final vote to go to war in the, uh, in the Spartan government, the decision was motivated more by honor because the, uh, the, the king of Sparta argued that Sparta was not ready for war. Yes, we have a grievance. Yes, we have a, gr a grave problem with the Athenians, but we're not ready for war. We should wait. We should prepare. The effort a lesser official, but empowered to speak on an equal status in the assembly of the Spartans, cast that aside, didn't even try to rebut that argument. He said, the Athenians have offended our honor. They have undermined our status. We cannot allow them to get away with this. We have to go to war immediately. Now, as events showed in the first 10 years of that war, he was wrong. Sparta was not ready for war, and they suffered terribly and made many mistakes in the first 10 years of war. But he carried the day because he invoked honor and his people responded to him. Fear, honor, and interest. Now, fear we all understand. Interest can be measured. It often has a numerical value. It often has a monetary value. So it's not an ephemeral concept. I want to zero in on these brief remarks this morning on the third factor, which is honor. I would argue that honor is the most difficult of these three factors to understand on the basis of which to make rational and sound decisions. And it is, in fact, the most relevant to the issues that we're talking about in the Middle East. Honor is the preeminent consideration of diplomats and specifically of American diplomats working in the Middle East. I would assert, ladies and gentlemen, that American diplomats, and this is not unique to 
the American diplomatic service, but I'm speaking of the context of our policy in the region that we're talking about. American diplomats live and work on the front lines of honor. American diplomats live and work on the front lines of honor. And what I mean by that is not that they're more honorable than our military colleagues or uh, uh, than our fellow citizens from any other walk of life, but American diplomats live and work in the place where our honor, the values, principles, moral considerations, norms that we consider to be essential to who we are and to how we live, where that, that, that definition of honor meets the definition of honor formulated in other societies. Religious values, personal values, perceptions of historical grievance. This is one way of understanding the recent controversy over that film that I hope not many of you have seen, but many of you probably have, we, uh, or the, the, the brief film snippet on, on YouTube. The reason this was controversial is because it transgressed the model of honor, which many people in the world, perhaps not very many, very many people in the United States, but many people in other parts of the world held dear. Therefore, it was very important. A particularly elemental and yet difficult to hold on to, it seems to me, concept about honor is this. Our society gets to decide on our own, without any input from anyone outside, what we consider to be honor. No Muslim from another country can say to the United States, you shouldn't be so concerned about women's rights. That's not such a big deal. You shouldn't be so concerned about other issues that we're always complaining about in the Middle East. Nor, by the same token, can we say to peoples and leaders and governments in that part of the world, your definition of honor is wrong. You should not be adhering to these values. You should be listening to us and being more enlightened in the ways that we are. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's the essence of the conversation that diplomats have on an ongoing basis every day, day in and day out. The diplomat's job is to understand the definition of honor in the place where we live and work and to translate that back to our society and of course it is no less and by the same token the responsibility of the diplomat to convey a correct interpretation and understanding of our sense of honor to the other societies to the leaders and government governing institutions of those societies in the hope of minimizing differences narrowing the disjunction to the extent that that can be done between those definitions of honor and averting conflict. That often can be done. Every time we avert a conflict, well, you don't know about it because it's a conflict that we didn't have. But that's something that diplomats are doing on an ongoing basis every day. And that's, of course, what my good friend Chris Stevens was doing with his embassy staff in Libya on September the 11th. Now, let me turn to the Arab Spring and relate this concept, I, I think I can do that. I'm going to try. Going from, ta from Thucydides, I'm going to uh, invoke the assistance of the Roman historian Tacitus in making the transition here. Tacitus, unlike Thucydides, was not so analytical. He reported everything that happened, and he did it in a very interesting and vivid way, but he didn't analyze it so much. He didn't give you a paradigm of psychology and motivation and of, of the uh, theoretical framework in which events happened in his time. So he often included things that he wasn't sure if they happened at all, but it was a good anecdote, it was entertaining, so he put it in. For example, in one passage, he refers to, uh, to Germany, yes, should have thought of this, <laughs> a report that he's heard of flames erupting from the earth in Germany, causing massive forest fires, engulfing villages and killing whole populations. Now he adds, you know, I'm really not sure if this is true. As a matter of fact, it sounds a little bit unlikely, but many people are saying it, and so I pass it on for what it's worth. The reason I mention that is it has struck me over these last couple of years that the way many media pundits, none in this room, of course, but the way some in the media, some in the punditocracy have looked at the air of spring is almost as if it's flame bursting out of the earth. How could such an amazing, strange thing be happening? This came out of nowhere. Why didn't we see this coming? This is so odd. Well, in fact, I don't think that's 
a, a, a valid analytical model for looking at this phenomenon. It's not flame bursting out of the earth. And in fact, we can understand it a lot better, again, if we step back and look at the framework of history. I very much appreciated the remarks, which I found very informative and very thought-provoking from Consul General Asa yesterday in invoking the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire has been missing, in my view, from many of the analyses and discussions of the Arab Spring. And in fact, in my view, it should be in every discussion of the Arab Spring. But it's not only the Ottoman Empire. I'm going to step back even a little bit further and say that there are patterns of human behavior that are constant when an empire comes to an end. Certain things have to be sorted out. And I, I want to touch on this briefly before I come back specifically to the Arab Spring. An empire is an extraordinary political entity, very different from the sort of governance uh, which most of us live with today. In an empire, the one point I want to zero in the, on that I think is relevant here, in an empire there are multiple nationalities. Your nationality is not the same as the government and the borders of the state in which you live. The emperor's job involves taking care of many nationalities, not one of which should have a priority or an advantage over the others. When the empire comes to an end and the emperor is swept away, each of these individual groups, be they religious or ethnic or based on some other organizing principle, each of them is now exposed and must fend for itself and must figure out a new way without the protection, sometimes the poor protection, but theoretically it was always there, and now they must fend for themselves and assure their security without the protection of the emperor. So what happens? Some of them immigrate. Some of them get massacred. Some of them change their affiliation and join one of the other groups. Some of them try to draw new boundaries and create new states out of the old empire and to, def to defend those, those new boundaries as the basis of their new security. We see exactly this pattern in the phasing out of the Roman Empire, the Habsburg Empire, the Soviet Empire, and of course, coming back to the point, the Ottoman Empire. What's happening with the Arab Spring and across the region is the playing out of forces and trends and natural impulses in the political realm which were not able to be sorted out at the actual end of the Ottoman Empire almost 100 years ago. There are a number of reasons for that, the largest being the, uh, the influence of European colonialism, which froze things in place, imposed other models of governance, and then evolution, coups, local developments took place from there. But I would assert that uh, at the risk of generalizing grossly, that in every place, the foundation on which this evolution was built was not as sound as it would have been if the peoples of those regions at the end of the empire had been able to sort out these issues for themselves. One important aspect of the sorting out at the end of empire is for each of these newly emerging groups now becoming an independent country in some fashion to decide on their definition of honor, how they will project it, how they will protect it, and how they will interact with neighbors and other states and other populations who have differing models of honor, models of honor that might be in conflict with their own. So what we see across the Middle East now, after this substantial period of Arab Spring events, is the beginning of the emergence of these new models of honor, not so much answers, but the questions beginning to come into clearer focus. Those will be formulated and addressed in part in the writing of constitutions, which we see going on in many places across the region now. Ladies and gentlemen, those constitutions will be the deliverable from the Arab Spring. It doesn't mean that the game is over when you see them, but it will be a very significant threshold point and you will see where these societies are heading and how they are answering the question of what is our sense of honor, how will we project it, what are our values, how will we defend them, and how will we interact with other societies 
that have models of honor different from our own. This can be very problematic. It need not be, but it certainly can. And for better or worse, the input of the United States into the formulation of these new constitutions is very limited. I can assure you that American diplomats will be on the front lines of honor, intervening in appropriate ways, not in inappropriate ways, to project our values, to offer advice where it can be offered and where it can be listened to. But the heavy lifting in all of these processes will be undertaken by those peoples themselves in an interaction between the large populations and the individuals, parties, civil society organizations which have emerged in those places. In a swirl of interaction, they collectively will shape their new society and decide how it's going to interact with ours. We know that there will continue to be a disjunction, if I can use that term, between the prevailing definition of honor in the countries in this part of the world and our own. That does not necessitate conflict by any means, but it creates the possibility for friction, misunderstanding, and yes, of conflict in the future. It's also possible that you will see leaders, parties, factions within some of these states who will not be seeking what we would consider a solution. They will be seeking, on the contrary, to cite that disjunction and to exploit that for short-term internal political gain on a very narrow basis. Where and when you see that, it's always a bad sign. Where you see leaders who are trying to understand and minimize that grounds for conflict, then the, the, the possibility of mutual understanding and fruitful cooperation becomes much greater. So I will conclude, ladies and gentlemen, by saying it's a very exciting time to be looking at this region. For me, it's a very exciting time to be working on behalf of the United States within this region and to be part of the effort that Chris Stevens represented, along with his staff at the embassy, working on the front lines of honor where American diplomats work and live and sometimes die. Okay, thank you uh, to the organizers of this conference, particularly to Brian Murphy and his team for bringing this all together. Uh, Brian, your timing is perfect. Um, since I have only about 12 to 15 minutes, um, what I propose to do is to um, try to provide brief answers to some of the focus questions that were given to uh, at least um, myself and I'm assuming to everyone else in the conference. If you don't have those focus questions, it doesn't matter. I will read them out before I begin to answer them. And if you're interested in a more sort of systematic treatment, I'm drawing upon an article that I recently published in the De Denver Journal uh, of International Law and Policy um, called U.S. Foreign Policy, um, um, the Arab Spring and the Question of Democracy um, in, the, in the current issue. And so the first question that we were asked to sort of reflect upon is the following. In general terms, how do you describe the current political situation in the Middle East and the role of the United States in the region? Well, I think um, the first point that needs to be um, um, discussed is that the um, broad political situation in the Middle East is described by an authoritarian landscape. With the exception of Israel and Turkey, all of the countries in the region are known for their um, non-democratic um, um, structure. Um, there are very few democracies in um, the broader Middle East. Um, if you look at some of the systematic sort of analysis of um, democracy and development by independent organizations such as Freedom House, they persistently record that among all the different regions in the world, the Middle East, in particular the Arab world, has some of the um, worst figures with respect to political rights and civil rights. And so there is an authoritarian landscape that characterizes the region. Uh, these are states that are um, developing states. 
they are relatively young in terms of their political history. And over the last, um, I would say, four to five decades since the era of um, political independence emerged in the Middle East, in other words, post-World War II, these post-colonial regimes have largely been failed developmental models. Economically, they've been a failure, and politically, they've been a failure. You have all of the stresses and strains that developing societies are facing, high population um, uh, growth rates, um, um, a significant youth bulge, um, lack of jobs, environmental um, problems, congested cities, but most importantly, politically repressive states that, um, um, that rule over these um, um, societies. And the, the term in Arabic is mukhabarat states. That's a, that's, that, that's tra that's the transla to, to translate that term, uh, most states in the Middle East are mukhabarat states or police states. They're run out of the Ministry of Intelligence and Interior, they are um, um, repressive states. If you look at the human rights record of all of these states, just read the annual Amnesty International reports, these states can also be described um, to varying degrees as torture states. Now, all of them aren't as bad as the Assad regime in Syria now, who is committing systematic war crimes and crimes against humanity. But all states practice repression. They torture their own citizens. They have horrific uh, human rights records. And that's very much what the Arab Spring was really about. It was about this youth bulge um, 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 uh, a new generation of young people um, who are more highly educated than their parents, more globalized in terms of their worldview. Um, critically, they are non-ideological. They're not really towing a particular party line, but they desire a better future. And they desire a change in the authoritarian um, um, apparatus that, um, that has engulfed and uh, suffocated their lives. Now, prior to the Arab Spring, it was long assumed that the voice of the people in the region did not matter in terms of US foreign policy. There was a tacit and widespread assumption that the voice of the people in the Middle East was either too fractured, too politically immature, or too radical be to be taken seriously. Similarly, there was an erroneous assumption that the Arab authoritarian order was there to stay. In the same way that in about a decade ago, Long-standing dictators in Morocco, Jordan, and Syria passed on their political thrones to their sons. It was widely thought, and in some political circles hoped, that the same process would follow in Egypt, Libya, Yemen, and beyond. This assumption no longer applies. As a new generation of Arabs and Muslims have come of age and are politically asserting themselves, the old political order is gradually receding and a new one is emerging on the horizon, where the theme of democracy, is now at the center of the politics of the region. Now, where does US foreign policy fit into this picture? Long-standing US policy that has existed with respect to the Middle East uh, has been focused on the theme of political stability. That was the preference over parliamentary democracy. Stability was a code word, in other words, for support for authoritarian regimes that protected US interests from hostile forces from within the region and from outside of the region. And you just go through the list. The Shah of Iran, the House of Saud in Saudi Arabia, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan in Morocco, in, in jo the Hashemite Kingdom in Jordan, uh, Mubarak in Egypt, um, Ali Abdel Salah in Yemen, um, uh, the King of Morocco, Ben Ali in Tunisia, et cetera, et cetera. All of them um, close US allies supported by the United States. Um, um, and the United States was protecting that regional order. And there's always been a fundamental tension between US policy toward the region and the idea of democratic governments emerging. And just let me highlight one particular story that sort of captures this particular theme. Um, in the lead up to the 2003 uh, occupation and invasion of Iraq, the United States, the Bush administration at the time was hoping to open a northern front through Turkey as a way of invading Iraq. And the new, newly elected democratic government in Turkey was subjected to quite a bit of intense pressure, lobbying by the United States to allow that to happen. And Turkey had just experienced a, uh, a national election, a new government was in power, the economy was in crisis, the Bush administration dangled a $32 billion aid package in front of the Turkish government, and there was a major debate in Turkey. Should we allow this to happen, we could certainly use the money. The parliament was, was, was debating this issue, the press was debating this issue, and after a public debate on this particular question, 
the overwhelming um, majority of, 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 of votes in the, in the Turkish parliament and in terms of public opinion, if you look at public opinion polls, over 90% of Turks oppose the idea of allowing um, the United States to open up a northern corridor into Iraq. After the overthrow of Saddam Hussein, Paul Wolfowitz travels to Ankara and in a very famous uh, comment, scolds the Turkish parliament and says publicly that he wished that the Turkish military would have played a more central role in shaping Turkish foreign policy. And this results in a huge crisis inside Turkey because the military has historically been shaping political life and there was an emerging democratic process that was taking place. And Paul Wolfowitz you know, basically comes out and sort of says, you know, we really like the fact, or we wish the fact that military generals were shaping Turkish uh, foreign policy, not democratic parliaments. And that, I think, is a deeply insightful story that speaks to a larger principle regarding U.S. foreign policy toward the Middle East, that greater democracy does not always translate into greater support for U.S. geostrategic interest in the region. There's often a chasm between popular indigenous nationalist sentiment on key geostrategic issues versus the foreign policy preferences of the United States. Tamara Kaufman Witz, the former US Deputary, Secret the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs has correctly observed that, quote, the broad problem that haunts American democratization efforts is that the general preference for democratic politics has long been tempered in regard to the Arab world by the knowledge that the victors of a democratic process in most Arab countries are unlikely to be the parties who share America's policy preferences in the region. And you can see that right now with respect to the tension between Turkey and Israel. As Turkey democratizes, certainly not a perfect democracy, a lot of problems, but as Turkey moves toward more democratic and an open political system, Turkey, 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 Turkish politicians are now responsible to the popular sentiment in their societies. And that sentiment is largely a Muslim population who identify with the suffering of the Palestinians. And so with respect to these um, aid flotillas that were going to Gaza that Israel tried to prevent, there's a clash, nine Turkish citizens are killed, a major rupture in terms of Turkish-Israeli relations. The Turkish government has to respond to popular sentiment in its own society. The United States doesn't like the fact that Turkey is now responding to different constituencies instead of a uh, a constituency based in, in Washington, D.C. There's a crisis there. Look at the speech that Mohamed Morsi gave, the new democratically elected president of Egypt at the UN General Assembly last week, uh, last month, sorry. Um, a big portion of that speech was, uh, was about the centrality and the importance of the plight of the Palestinians. Look at what's happening in Tunisia as they write their new constitution. There's a big debate as to whether Tunisia should normalize relations with Israel. Um, so these are some of the broader sort of, um, sort of stresses that we can see, tensions that we can see as the region democratizes or tries to move toward democracy and the previous preferences of US foreign policy. So the key point here is that historically speaking, we in the United States have been used to dealing with Middle Eastern dictators and authoritarian regimes who have been our allies and the protectors of American interests in the region. While the aspirations of nationalist forces, both secular and religious, have been ignored. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as you probably know or should know or have figured out on your own, the ground has now shifted. And the United States is going to have to make an adjustment. The voice of the people now matter in the politics of the region, and they can no longer be ignored. Now, with respect to question number two of the focus question, I mean, it's a big question. What are the causes and consequences of the conflicts that disrupt governance across the region? Again, this is connected to my previous answer. Authoritarian regimes are inherently unstable regimes. Not only do they repress their own populations, but they also pursue regional politics and regional rivalries that are really fundamentally geared toward preserving their own stranglehold on power. They meddle in each other's affairs in each other's affairs. They pursue policies that are really geared towards fundamentally um, preserving that which is most important for them, their own power and privilege, and that of their family and their, and their, and their, and their inner circle. And so you have these rivalries that are 
um, emerging in the region and that can really tear the region apart. I'm talking about specifically not the Arab-Israeli conflict, which is important in itself, but this emerging conflict between uh, Sunnis and Shi'is in the region. There is a major rivalry um, that we've already seen it taking place in Iraq. It could uh, manifest itself in, in, in a similar way, perhaps a worse way, in, in, in Syria. And it's really fueled by uh, a conflict between Saudi Arabia and its allies and Iran and its allies over regional hegemony. Um, this is a major problem, and I think the fundamental nature of that problem is that you have authoritarian regimes that are not willing to accommodate minority rights, and um, they are pursuing policies that are inherently conflictual and leading and expanding these, these, these problems. What can the United States do about this, and what should US, the U.S. role be in terms of supporting democracy? Well, I think the United States um, can do a lot, but it has to be very careful. One size does not fit all. What works in Tunisia will not work in Iran. And I think fundamentally, in terms of U.S. foreign policy, before presuming to know how the United States can support democracy in the region, I think we have to take a step back, we have to take a deep breath, and we have to ask democratic forces in the region, what do they want from us? We shouldn't presuppose to know that answer in advance. And if you talk to democratic forces in the region, they'll give you different answers. What are the possible solutions or approaches to stabilizing the region politically? Well, I think the United States needs to, I think, um, um, shape its policies based on its stated values. Democracy, human rights, open societies, responsible government. Uh, historically, we have not done that. And we need to say that clearly and openly both to our friends and our adversaries that there are certain principles that the United States stands on and it will not backtrack. I think that's important. There's a lot more to say on that conflict, on, on that particular topic, but I'll save it to the Q&A session. So just let me get to a conclusion. I think there's a broad consensus among Middle East scholars, among people who analyze the politics of the region, that we are entering a new historical phase. Where it might end up, it's open to question. I'm personally optimistic. But in contrast to the past, the key internal axes of conflict that will shape the contours of political power in the region will be the public demands for citizenship rights and effective and accountable government. While transitions to democracy will take time and then the consolidations of those transitions even longer, there is no denying that the Arab Spring today is a historic turning point in the modern history of the region. The rules have changed and it can no longer be business as usual. For the United States, this will require an adjustment in terms of how it views and deals with a new Middle East. And I think to his credit, at least rhetorically, President Obama has been, I think, broadly speaking, since the beginning of the Arab Spring, on the right side of history. On May 19th of 2011, he delivered a major foreign policy speech on the Arab Spring where he spoke about, quote, a new chapter in American diplomacy. In contrast to his predecessors, he sought to, he sought to strike a balance between American interests and American values in the Middle East. And he acknowledged that, quote, a broad strategy based solely on narrow, the narrow pursuit of these longstanding American interests will not fill an empty stomach or allow someone to speak their mind. Moreover, failure to speak to the broader aspirations of ordinary people will only feel, feed the suspicion that has festered for years in the Middle East that the United States pursues its own interests at the expense of the people in the Middle East. In Obama's speech, he announced a new policy toward the region to, quote, promote reform across the region and to support transitions to democracy. He noted that while, quote, each country is different, we need to speak honestly about the principles we believe in with friend and foe alike. Our message is simple, President Obama said. If you take the risks that reform entails, you will have the full support of the United States. Whether the United States is able to live up to these words, I think remains to be seen. The resumption of arms sales to Bahrain, despite a crackdown on pro-democracy protesters, and the refusal to tie American aid to Egypt to progress on democratization, notwithstanding the arrest of American NGO workers earlier this year, suggests more continuity with the past than a departure toward a new U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. In his recent book, Fawaz Jerges has written about Obama and the Middle East, and he echoes this skeptical reading of American policy. 
he observes that Obama has shown more continuity with the past than real change. He's adopted a centrist, realist approach toward the region, an approach consistent with the dominant US foreign policy orientations of previous years. The problem, however, and this is really the key to my presentation, is that this traditional tr approach toward the Middle East um, and the old assumptions that shaped and guided US policy toward the region will no longer work. A specter is haunting US policy toward the Middle East. And with revolutions and pro-democracy movements breaking out throughout the region, democracy responsible government demands for full citizenship rights and accountable government is the only game in town. Adjusting to this new reality will take time and it will be difficult because of this long past policy of dealing with our friends in the region, most of whom were authoritarian repressive regimes. But now the Arab Islamic world is coming of age and we are all observers of this historic, uncertain and tumultuous phenomenon. Thanks for your time. Quite a few national boundaries are gonna to have to change. Right? There's no reason why the boundaries that were created by, not by the people of the region, but by the British and the French cleaning up the mess left by the Ottoman Empire have to remain, right? And the Kurds are gonna be the first ones to bolt for the exit, okay? That's, that's one thing I heard, that's one thing I took away from your remark. And for Nader Hashimi, I hope he's right, but I think his remarks about the long-term implications of the Arab Spring are at least 10 years premature. Maybe we don't have to go back to the French Revolution to evaluate the long-term implications. But talk to me about the second presidential election in Egypt, not the first one. Let's see what happens when we get to the second presidential election in Egypt. I, I think we have to address the possibility of what's known in regional shorthand as one man, one vote, one time. That the people who will prevail in these elections will take the opportunity to assert a new form of authoritarian rule. And another possibility is that because of all the problems in the region, including a very looming crisis over water shortage, right, it is possible that countries will dissolve, will not move forward, but will dissolve backward, as we're seeing now in Syria, and that the people will embrace the strong man and protector rather than the enlightened democratic leader. I, I think that's entirely possible. So I want to focus my remarks today on a country that's been outside the Arab Spring and in fact was almost entirely outside the Ottoman Empire, namely Saudi Arabia, which I've devoted my full, pretty much full-time attention to since 9-11. Um, I actually have a uh, five-year multiple entry visa to Saudi Arabia and my wife jokes that that's, um, uh, you know, what's second prize? What, what's first prize? A 10-year visa? I, you know, I have to go there again and again. So, <laughs> I, um, but it, the result of that is I, I have a much better Rolodex in Riyadh than I do in Washington. And I want to make a couple of points right at the beginning. You will hear uh, talk over the next few years about a potential succession crisis in Saudi Arabia. Don't believe it, right? They, they've survived the deaths of two crown princes in the past year, and it will be handled within the family. Right? And, and, and they know perfectly well what the implications are for themselves. They'll work it out, and, and none of us in this room will ever know what actually happens. But I don't believe there's going to be a succession crisis. But let me just say that if for, if in the terms of the national interests of the United States, it doesn't make much difference who becomes king and the king after that in Saudi Arabia. Because the economic and strategic policies of the kingdom will remain in place no matter who is king. None of the princes running for king in the family councils is running on a platform of disrupting the fundamental strategic and economic relationship with the United States. And if you assume that the House of Saud are going to remain in power, which I think is a very strongly valid assumption, don't worry for yourself about who becomes king of Saudi Arabia. It may matter a good bit more to the citizens within the country because individual kings will grant more or less personal space to individuals. Abdullah has granted more. People were apprehensive that if Nayef became king, he would narrow the rules. But outside the country, I don't think it matters that much. Now, let me just say that um, I want to run quickly through a bunch of points that, I mean, any one of which could be the subject of an entire conference of this length. 
so I'll, I'll go quickly. Um, in, in, in the middle of the previous decade, if you go back to 1990, uh, to 2005, let's say, the greatest threat to the stability of Saudi Arabia um, was the uprising by Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which was a direct armed challenge of, of desperados to the regime and began with the housing compound attacks in Riyadh in 2003. Um, that uprising failed. Right? There is no jihad, armed jihadist uprising in Saudi Arabia now. Plenty of people sympathize with the extremists, but the uprising failed, and one reason it failed, one of many reasons it failed, was that the people didn't support it. Because they understood, as Sheikh Salman al-Oda pointed out in his famous open letter to Osama bin Laden, that Al-Qaeda offered no program. Al-Qaeda offered only death, mostly to other Muslims. And so it got no traction with the people of Saudi Arabia, even those who presumably sympathized with its aspirations about the caliphate. So then, once that was contained, the greatest threat to Saudi Arabia for a while was external. That is to say, you can envision the combination of civil war in Iraq and state failure in Yemen occurring simultaneously, uh, posing an enormous threat to um, the stability and security of the, uh, of, of the Saudi state. Uh, I think now there's a whole new set of concerns and it's hard to say uh, because of uncertainties about the Saudi leadership, it's hard to say what's at the top of their uh, list at the moment. Um, a lot of their concern about these other issues was diverted by the uprising in Bahrain. And as you know, the Saudis intervened directly. They convinced themselves, rightly or wrongly, I think without much evidence, that the uprising in Bahrain was instigated by I Iran and that Iran was, had designs on sort of extending its influence across the causeway uh, right into eastern Saudi Arabia. Uh, I think the evidence of, of Iranian involvement in Bahrain is very thin, uh, but the Saudis went in there and they're still there. Now, you may recall that they got some police units from the United Arab Emirates to join their troops in going into Bahrain and they presented the intervention as a collective decision by the organization known as the Gulf Cooperation Council, which is the organization of the kingdoms, the Arab kingdoms, on the western side of the Gulf. But I don't think anybody was really fooled because the Gulf Cooperation Council was not designed as a collective security organization and has never become an effective collective security organization. Essentially, it, it was designed to give a cloak of multinational legitimacy to what the Saudis did. Uh, Roby will talk more about this in, in the next session. But it, in my view, from the point of view of the Gulf Sheikhdoms, all of them, the most important regional security organization, the one that works, is CENTCOM, the US Central Command. That's the organ security organization that matters to them. And if you go back and read the very interesting collective speeches of David Petraeus when he was the commander of CENTCOM. The United States has been working with them to build up a policy of what I think he called multilateral unilateralism, in which none of these countries wants to be in a collective security organization that would inevitably be dominated by Saudi Arabia. So they all attach themselves to a single protective force that sort of forces them to work together. That force is us. That force is CENTCOM. Now, in, it, there are many reasons why there really was no Arab Spring uprising in Saudi Arabia. I, I, there's a whole chapter in my book about it. We could go on and on about it. But I do want to say that I don't believe the analogy to the Shah is valid at all. Right? Unlike the Shah, the Al Saud are widely perceived and generally accepted as the legitimate rulers of Saudi Arabia. They are not usurpers. They did not, unlike the Shah, they did not put the Persian Empire or the, or the history of the peninsula ahead of Islam. Unlike the Shah, they are not perceived as the best friends of Israel in the region. Uh, the the Al-Saud have a 250-year history 
of laboring, eventually successfully, to create the country that exists today. And if you look at all protests, petitions, um, declarations, whatever there are, almost uniformly you can say that they don't call for the overthrow of the regime. This is not Syria. I think that's the primary reason, but there are many others, including the ability of the state to deploy extensive economic and security resources to put down trouble. Now, it seems to me that um, over the past six months or so, uh, I was there most recently in June, we've, I've, I've encountered the highest level and frequency and intensity of public dissent and protest in many years. There have been demonstrations by families of political prisoners and terrorism suspects demanding justice. There was a very bizarre episode of a female university student down in Abha staging an uprising against the authorities. Uh, there have been public demonstrations at malls and government buildings in Riyadh, and online tirades in support of a human rights activist named Mohammed al Khatani, who knew he was stepping over the line in what he said when he, when he denounced Prince Nayef as a crook and a criminal. Um, Khatani is now on trial, and uh, he has a lot of support in the community. By the way, he still has his government job, uh, one of the most peculiar things about him. Um, but none of this was anywhere near critical mass, and none of these protests sought the overthrow of the regime. People are seeking um, accountability, more citizen input into decision making, an end to corruption, transparency in the, transparency in the judicial system, and more dynamic leadership. Uh, and let me say that one reason that the Saudis are not seeking the downfall of the regime is that they have never perceived a different model of government, an alternative model to what they have now that would be preferable for them and bring them greater prosperity, security, and opportunity. And certainly, anything that says made in USA on it is a negative, that's a negative label. And they don't necessarily see parliamentary democracy as a goal to which they ought to aspire. You say elections, they say Kuwait. You say elections, they say Lebanon. You say elections, they say Algeria. You say elections, they even say Bush v. Gore. You know? And so they, they don't see that, or, or the fiscal cliff, they don't see an alternative to what they have now, and therefore they're not aspiring to, to install a different model from what they have now. The great exception to this, of course, is the Shia of the eastern province the stage of the uprising and the, Shia, uh, uh, the uh, protests and dissent among the Shia in the eastern province right now is the highest it's been in quite some time. And in my opinion, the regime has substantially mishandled it. Uh, if you read this, there's a long story in this morning's Washington Post by my friend Kevin Sullivan, who's been there. Um, the Shia have many grievances, uh, legitimate grievances, but one of them, it, the regime has responded by treating them as a kind of Iranian fifth column, which is exactly the wrong thing. If you go to the eastern province and you talk to the people in the Shia community, they want you to understand that they are Arabs first. What they want is their rights as citizens of Saudi Arabia. Uh, they don't want to be agents of Iran. And this is an, it, these people would be easy to placate with a few cost-free token gestures by the government. Let two Shia go to the military academy. Appoint a Shia ambassador somewhere, even to another Shia country. They won't do it because the Shia are reviled as apostates and not true, Islam, not true Muslims. And so their grievances are legitimate, but they do not have the numbers or the intensity or the organizational ability to really threaten the government. And in fact, a lot of the Shia are quite prosperous. It's not as if they're arising from the lack of opportunity. So a, um, let me just say one other thing, that in Saudi Arabia, these are economic boom times, okay? Uh, the kingdom's problem is not lack of resources. Vast industrial projects are going on even as we speak, many of them in partnership with American companies, uh, GE, Dow Chemical, um, Alcoa. The kingdom's problem is not a lack of resources, not the legitimacy of the ruler, but a lack of management capability 
and a reluctance to turn their own citizens loose to address their own problems. In, there's no NGOs in Saudi Arabia because the regime regards all citizen groups as inherently dangerous politically. I think that began to change with the internet organized public response to the Jeddah floods of three years ago, but the government has not embraced this change. One final note, contrary to what you might think, one of the biggest problems facing Saudi Arabia is an acute and growing shortage of energy. Okay? And there are many reasons for that. One of the Saudi responses is to commit itself to the construction of a network of 16 nuclear power plants over the next 15 years. Uh, watch this space because the question is, as the Saudis get into that, what are they going to take as their position about control of the nuclear fuel cycle? In Abu Dhabi, the leaders of the UAE agreed in a formal agreement with the United States to forego both ends of the nuclear fuel cycle. They will, not repro they will not enrich their own uranium, and they will not reprocess their spent fuel. I'm not sure the Saudis are going to accept that deal. And this is a potential irritant to U.S.-Saudi relations that nobody has really dealt with yet because the negotiations about this have not formally begun. Thank you very much. So thank you very much uh, to the panel. And I'm almost tempted to um, um, practice some uh, democracy here on the, on the panel and to let the um, uh, members of the panel ask questions among themselves. Um, maybe we should focus on two points. One is uh, definitely the U.S. foreign policy in the region, and we have seen the, the broad uh, outlines by um, Alan Meisenheimer and the kind of, um, how would I say it, um, critical or reserved answer by uh, Mr. Hashimi. So maybe you could discuss the controversies in U.S. foreign policy and also the outcome, I mean, we are all no prophets um, of the Arab Spring, but some see it more pessimistic, some more optimistic, whatever it means. Um, so I would like also to open the discussion among yourselves and to ask your colleagues um, if you would like to start. Well, I, I'll, I'll offer one uh, observation. I very much appreciated the uh, remarks of, of both of my colleagues on the panel. Um, I, I found a lot of food for thought. I didn't find much to disagree with, yeah. frankly. Uh, I, I think the, uh, the realities that have been pointed out here are, are pretty clear and, and pretty difficult, uh, very challenging for us as we go ahead. Uh, the observation I wanted to make is that the, the challenge is unfortunately augmented by the way in which the discussion over these issues and how the United States deals with them, uh, th the way that it's conducted here. If that debate were conducted in bodies like this, led by voices like these, I think you'd have a good chance of the United States coming out with, with a wise policy. But unfortunately, what happens is that uh, the, the issues become politicized and weighed down with, uh, with cliches and historical baggage, much of which is not relevant in ways that it used to be. And so it becomes difficult to see, even with the amount of clarity which is achievable. And that's limited. But if you cloud that, with, uh, with historical baggage and with cliches and with ideological agendas, then it becomes less likely, unfortunately, that we're going to come out with the right policy mix and position ourselves as best we can. I, I think that the point which was made several ways that uh, the United States is going to have to differentiate among the different countries of the region and be nimble in our interactions with the, uh, the emerging situation on the ground with civil society and uh, groups and individuals who speak with more credibility and authority for the interests of the population. I think that that's a, a really powerful point and it would be difficult in my view to overstate how difficult it will be to do that responsibly, both because it's hard on the ground and it's hard at the absolute other end of the, uh, of, of the policy process, at the highest level, 
to talk about that in a responsible way and to resist the temptation to try to find a one-size-fits-all sort of approach, uh, which I just don't think is, is going to be available to us. The other note I would sound just briefly is that the, uh, the, the specific set of challenges with regard to Iran that the region and the United States faces right now overshadow all of these other issues and are a variable which is rather separate to those. And uh, that complicates things orders of magnitude uh, and developments with regard to the Iran situation could uh, vastly set back both developments on the ground in the region and the process of developing responsible and appropriate and successful models of American policy in the region. So I, I think Iran is another space that we have to, uh, we have to keep an eye on. Um, I, I would really like to hear what the audience has to say in terms of questions and comments. I mean, uh, I, I don't have any substantive disagreement um, with the other two panelists. I mean, I could, I, I could comment on this whole discussion of honor in the Middle East and, and maybe provide a different sort of take on, on Alan's treatment of the topic, and I could sort of raise some issues about the question of the legitimacy of the uh, House of Saud uh, and the question of parliamentary democracy, um, but I don't think there's, there's a major points of sort of um, like I said, substantive disagreement. I'd love to hear what the audience is, is thinking and, and, and bring them into the conversation. Okay, so I would like to give you a last chance and then uh, if you agree, then we skip the panel discussion and I think as you saw some I, I, I would up, so I would just add that I, I, this is a time of extreme uncertainty and it's really very difficult to mm. make projections about U.S. policy. If, if, if you Consider, I mean, what do these countries have in common? Libya, Syria, Yemen, Egypt, Iran, Tunisia, and the United States. What they have in common is we have no idea who's going to be running them in five years. <laughs> and in some of them, we don't even know what kind of government is going to be in charge in five years. And you might even add Israel to that list. So to, I think that it's correct that we'll have an overriding set of interests and principles but you're correct, I, I agree completely that applying them in the case of, they can't be necessarily applied region-wide. Okay, I think I should open it to, to the public, uh, Arthur. Uh, yes, I have a question about process. Uh, how is U.S. policy crafted? How is U.S. policy towards a specific country or a specific region craft, crafted in the State Department? Does it start from the bottom up or from the top down? Or does some bureaucrat sit at a Mideast desk and present a, a series of papers on it? Or does, it, does the president and the uh, secretary of state sit down and craft the policy? Obviously, there's a, a complicated answer to that, but I, I'll do my best to encapsulate it. And I don't think there's a big surprise in it. it is. Uh, I, I'll venture to say it is more or less what I think you as, as an American citizen would want it to be. It's an open process that uh, uh, puts all possibilities and options and arguments on the table and ultimately the Secretary of State decides the hard questions, the easier ones, quote unquote, get decided at, at levels of authority further down. But to, to start a, at the top, it rarely happens that the, the policy turns on a dime because of a pronouncement at, at the highest level. I, I can think of a few examples of that. One of my favorites, well, my favorites, you, you'll see what I mean by that, uh, is during the Carter administration, you had a president who said that uh, uh, Israeli settlements in the West Bank are illegal. During the presidential campaign, uh, uh, candidate Reagan said, no, they're not. And so when the president was elected, when, when President Reagan was elected, uh, Israeli settlements in the West Bank were no longer illegal, according to American policy. That's a clear example. That is incredibly uncommon, however, in, in terms of the way it gets done. In terms of the way it gets done right now, looking at the very dynamic situation on the ground across the region, you have officials in our embassies. You have interaction with many, many levels of expertise, friends in other countries, friends from academia, people who have insight and knowledge about the situation on the ground who are feeding their views into the country desks, the public diplomacy apparatus of the State Department so that issues are being discerned, formulated into decisions, alternate decisions are being 
uh, developed in terms of weighing the pluses and minuses, and ultimately, as I began by saying, decisions are made at the appropriate level, going up the chain of leadership with the hardest ones, as you'd want them to, uh, arriving on the desk of the Secretary of State, and she makes those decisions. I'm sure there are some uh, uh, very difficult, very complex, very consequential decisions which the Secretary of State takes with her to the White House and discusses them there. But for the most part, it is a rigorous, institutionalized process. Yes, bureaucracy is a good thing, because you would not want these decisions made on the back of an envelope, uh, you know, as, as somebody's writing into work and jotting down ideas. You would want them to be developed systematically and worked through a rigorous, disciplined system, which is run by people who know what they're doing. And for the most part, I'd like to believe, and I do, that, uh, that that's how it works. I have a follow-up question. Um, Arthur, we have many, maybe later. Yeah, uh, this, <laughs> okay. I'm actually um, sort of intrigued by the question of honor and, and the different definitions, and so I want to take us back to your comment. I, I brought I, Thucydides with me, so we can, uh, there, we can there consult we the expert. Um, so I'd actually, like, I'd actually like the other two panelists to comment on, on this, this, this question of honor um, and how this plays out in the Middle East. Um, well, this issue was raised recently in the context of the protests in Libya and Egypt with respect to this controversial film. Um, uh, we've seen similar incidents before with respect to the Danish cartoons, the Salman Rushdie affair, etc. And I think one uh, key point that's, uh, I think, at the core of this question um, and that bears keeping in mind is that the concept of the sacred still exists as a category um, that is closely associated with people's sense of identity. There is this realm in human um, uh, existence in, in social relations where people who are religiously minded um, believe that these areas that are considered to be sacred should not be subject to critique, um, ridicule, um, uh, they should be off limits, in other words, with, with respect to sort of artistic freedom. Um, and in the context of Muslim majority societies, that's the Prophet Muhammad, that's um, the Quran. And, and this whole notion of sort of uh, um, certain aspects or certain themes, certain topics being sort of not subject to open debate and ridicule is not something that is uniquely Islamic or Muslim. I mean, we in the West. Um, have had similar debates over these questions. Just look at the number of books historically that have been banned, for example, from teaching because they offended community values. Um, 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 and that broadly, and the reason for that is because I think you know um, most of Muslim societies are still transiting from tradition to modernity. These debates that have taken place in the West over these questions of freedom of expression um, have not taken place in most Muslim societies because they've been characterized by authoritarian regimes. There hasn't been an opportunity to debate the boundaries of freedom of expression and what the concept of a sacred actually means and can these definitions change over time. Um, they, that, that might change if the Arab and Islamic world opens up and there's a chance for people to debate this. It changed certainly in the West. You know, um, uh, and even in, in secular Europe, for example, there are things that are off topic that you can go to jail for in secular Europe if you, if you try to engage in sort of artistic expression and ridicule. So all societies, deeply religious, very secular, have their um, uh, boundaries. And so I think mo for Muslim societies, the question of um, their religious identity is, is something that's deeply you know, personal and people are passionate about it and they're not willing to, um, they're not willing to open it up to um, you know, some author who may legitimately, under the, sort of the, the, the argument of freedom of expression, want to sort of subject, to, subject it to critique or defamation. And we can understand why that would be the case um, in, in, in the West, but I think we have to appreciate that other societies have not gone through that process. And that's why I think when Obama was speaking about this point last month at the UN General Assembly, I think he stru struck a note, uh, the right note. He sort of said, look, you know, we um, do not support this film. We understand when people's religious sensibili sensibilities are, are sort of uh, hurt, and, but we're not going to bring people to court. We're not going to sort of limit freedom of expression. Um, now, that's an argument that he would make today. I think if it, a previous president, let's say three or four decades ago, I think would probably have struck a different 
a different chord if, it, if the issue was, for example, defamation of Christianity or defamation of sort of the, the, the flag of this country. Soci societies have different sort of levels of development, and I think the Middle East is sort of um, just beginning to, you know, deal with these questions of, uh, of honor and sacredness and, and trying to come to terms with what the limits of freedom of expression should be in their, in their own societies. I agree that honor is a deeply uh, ingrained and important part of the sort of collective psychology of the region. My experience has been that the weaker and more disenfranchised people are, the more important it becomes. And, and for that reason, uh, the slights are perceived uh, really as exaggerated because there are no other avenues of collective addressing grievances. And, and so it becomes exaggerated in that context. One, one of the reasons, if I may, one of the reasons, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, sorry, one of the reasons that the, uh, the framework of Thucydides is useful today is that he is remote enough from the actual immediate circumstances, the actual ideologies and principles that are in play in the world today, that you can use his model in, in a more or less abstract academic way, which is extremely <coughs> useful. If you look at, at uh, analyses essayed more or, or, or closer to us in time, it's difficult not to be employing a standard developed by a Christian uh, analyst in a Christian context in a Christian country. If you look at the, uh, the period of medieval Europe, I, I think uh, Natter's point is, uh, is powerfully illustrated in the way the sacred was used by leaders at that time. If you look in particular at the period of the first four crusades, the, the degree of hypocrisy from our remote standpoint of today looking back is off the scale. And yet at the time, it was judged that these were sacred obligations that were, in, uh, that were incumbent upon Christians to undertake, and there was no good way to argue against that in the context of that time. Uh, there is no perfect analogy in history, but I, I would suggest there's a degree of analogy between where we are in the Islamic world today and where Christian Europe was at that time in terms of the use of the sacred. In particular, however, I have to add, I, I think this, this is a point that, that, that Tom has touched on, where societies and governments feel that they are disadvantaged or have been oppressed, there is a strong temptation to be very extra defensive about these issues simply in order to assert your standing internationally and the validity of your society and your point of view. This is not something that is unique to Arabs or Muslims or the Middle East. This is simply human behavior. This is entirely consistent with what Thucydides observed among the Greeks of the fifth century. Human beings behave that way then, they behave that way now. Okay, um, Alan, yeah. Um, one of the questions in formation of American policy that is of interest to me is the potential not use of American military power in the future. And I think uh, Americans are pretty disgusted, as we all know, with what has happened in uh, Iraq and what has happened in Afghanistan. And I think future uses of American policy related to power is going to be very questionable by the American people themselves. And I'm wondering how that fits in to future formation of American policy. I, I'll respond very briefly by saying I couldn't agree with you more. I, I think America's greatest power is the soft power of our culture and our values, and I don't think those are in every case best projected, if I can say so, by the military. Uh, and we've all heard recent examples of our secretaries of defense, uh, the current one and his predecessor, powerfully making that argument that the United States needs to invest more in diplomacy and in peaceful cultural engagement, not only in the Middle East but around the world, rather than looking to our military power to project through power and the implied threat of power to achieve our interests around the world. But I'll conclude by saying a very simple point, which sounds simple but of course isn't. We need to elect political leaders who agree with the previous two, or the current and the previous Secretary of Defense on that point. I don't see a lot of them out there now. Yeah, very, very quickly, um, it's having a huge impact on policy. Um, there's war fatigue in this country, as you said. Um, five to six thousand Americans have been killed in Iraq and Afghanistan, tens of thousands more. I think it's shaping and it's affecting whether the United States will go to war again in the Middle East with respect to Iran. Big debate now about a possible war with Iran. And also with respect to the current tragedy in Syria. 
despite the crimes against humanity of the Assad regime, despite the, the devastation of the civilian population, opinion polls in the United States overwhelmingly are against any form of American intervention in Syria. And I think, in, from my perspective, I think that is, um, that is uh, something to regret, because the only thing that I think can really save the Syrian people from the Assad regime is if some external force comes to their rescue in the same way that it did uh, to the people of Libya. It made a critical difference. I think there's exceptions to the general rule of non-intervention, which I'm generally sympathetic to when it comes to intervening in the Middle East. But I think there are exceptions to the rule. I think Libya was one. Gaddafi would still be in power had NATO not come to the rescue of the Libyan people. And I suspect if there's not some form of external intervention, either from NATO or one of NATO's allies into Syria, the Assad regime is going to be able to survive for a lot longer than I think many people hope it does. My question is whenever uh, uh, U.S. foreign policy is crafted, uh, I believe that is probably an understanding from the Middle East, the people in the Middle East, that foreign, uh, free market is placed ahead of uh, democracy as a priority. And perhaps in the U.S. the popular understanding is that democracy is placed ahead of free market. How are those two different understandings or perceptions, whether right or wrong, can be, uh, who is responsible for consolidating those opinions, those beliefs, those misperceptions? Is it the media? Is it the state? Well, whoever wants to, maybe. Well, let me, let me just, let me just, let me just, yeah. you know, yeah. I first went to the Middle East in the height, during the middle of the Cold War in the 1970s. And several uh, economies, several national economies in the Middle East had adopted, beginning with Egypt, had adopted various forms of the state socialist model, right? And one of the first things Sadat did um, after he expelled his Soviet advisors was dismantle, begin to dismantle the state socialist model because it didn't work. And that, in fact, has happened all over, all over sub-Saharan Africa now. Um, and I... I don't see any um, conflict between the uh, aspirations of the free market and the democratic ideals, but one doesn't require the other. Um, but pretty much every regime now, except maybe Syria, uh, has moved much toward a uh, free market model because they can't afford to do otherwise. Yeah, I'm not sure if this answers to your question, but when we talk about U.S. interests in the Middle East, if you look at the scholarly academic literature on the topic, U.S. interests in the Middle East have traditionally been um, oil, support for Israel, and then preventing external powers or regional powers from dominating the region. Um, democracy really hasn't been on the agenda, except rhetorically, you know, particularly now after the Arab Spring. And when you hear American politicians, I think, speak about democracy, implied in that support for democracy is a particular economic system that democracy is often associated with, sort of free market, neoliberal economic principles. If, for example, um, Turkey, which is, you know, a democracy but a flawed one, um, were to decide democratically to shift its economic program and policies away from a free market model of economic exchange and move towards some sort of socialist model where there would be strict limits, government control. I think support in this country toward a socialist but democratic Turkey would change quite substantially because I think part of the um, factors that shape American foreign policy are really um, the question of U.S. business interests. Are those business interests being enhanced and advanced and, and, and open for business for American um, uh, business uh, um, executives and companies, et cetera. If, that, if that's not an option, then I think the enthusiasm among many um, foreign policy analysts and opinion makers and shapers of US foreign policy would shift quite substantially if a country that was democratic were to shift its economic policy. So I think there is an assumption, but I don't really think that's a problem because as I think um, um, Thomas uh, Littman has sort of suggested, if you look at everyone across the region, including the political Islamists, they all are very comfortable with free market economics. I mean, the Muslim Brotherhood are meeting with the IMF. The model that they look at is, is the Justice and Development Party in Turkey, and they're all, you know, um, you know urban bourgeoisie who love sort of exchange and, and business, uh, you know, relationships with, with the global community. So it's really a hypothetical question here. So it's really not a, a, a cause for concern, I think, at this moment. It might be in the future, but I don't see it happening. Would you like to comment? Well, they, they teach us in graduate school 
and I'm happy to assure you that we still see it in the State Department, that the United States has interest in different categories. We have political interests, we have economic interests, we have value interests. And the fact that those are measured on separate scales doesn't mean that one is necessarily ranked ahead of the other. But it is the rule rather than the exception that not just in the Middle East, but everywhere where we are uh, managing our relations with other countries, other societies, other regions, uh, that there is a degree of tension, inconsistency, even contradiction on occasion uh, between the metrics that we employ to, me to measure our interests in those three categories. You know, as they say, if this were easy, anybody would do it. Or there would never be a complaint about how well we do it because it would be so easy that we would always do it exactly the right way and we'd always agree on it. In fact, what happens when those inconsistencies, disagreements, and contradictions emerge, that process that I referred to earlier by which the various alternatives are formulated, argued out, and decided in a painful paper process uh, through the State Department and the National Security Council, that's how we reconcile them. They're always subject to revisitation later on, so the game, in effect, never ends. But the questions are, are never easy, and the answers are almost never final. I'm not trying to dodge your question, uh, but that's the closest I can come to a final answer to, uh, to your very logical question. Uh, let's assume, for argument's sake, that the aspirations of the Kurds reach a critical mass. And through some process, uh, it seems inevitable that the Kurds will have their own country. Does that um, spark a reevaluation of our posture toward the Kurds, the Turks, and any other country in the Middle East? not an easy answer, but... Well, very quickly, I mean, I just don't think that's a, a, on, on the table in the foreseeable future, because if you have um, an independent Kurdistan, you basically have a regional war in the Middle East. Iran, Turkey, and the central government in Iraq are strongly opposed to an independent Kurdistan. It's one of the tragic legacies of the colonial and imperial intervention in the Middle East that the Kurds were left out of this equation, and I really don't see um, um, an independent Kurdish state emerging in my lifetime, despite the legitimate, I think, um, claims that, that the Kurds should have to an independent state, given how, you know, they were treated by the countries that they live in and, 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 and the fact that, you know, if we could go back and redraw the borders, they, there definitely should have been an independent Kurdish state, but you can't roll back history. We're just, I think, stuck with what we have right now. And I don't see, you know, um, the United States supporting that. I think the United States has leaned quite heavily on the Iraqi Kurds to prevent an independent state largely because it would destabilize the region. So I just don't think it's on the table. I think the only hope for the Kurds is that the countries that which the Kurds live in, primarily Turkey, Iran, and Iraq, they undergo their own democratic transitions and they provide meaningful autonomy and rights for their minority populations. I think that's, that's the only, I think, foreseeable hope. Uh, I hate to say that to my Kurdish friends, but that's just, I think, the balance of power in the region as I see it. I think you don't have to add to this. Uh, just yeah. to, to say briefly, American policy is very much committed to the unity of Iraq, but a unified Iraq in which the Kurds are fully participating in the political system and enjoying the full rights of citizenship, so far it, it, that, that appears achievable, and we hope that will continue to be the case. Would, would you like to comment on this? Or? I, the other way to look at it is that the, the Kurd, collectively right now, the Kurds are not seeking the creation of a separate independent Kurdish state. Um, and it's in the interest of these countries where they live to n not have them do that by incorporating them into the body politic and giving them economic opportunities and so on. But what if, what if those states dissolve, fragment, dissolve into disorder? It, in recent years, it, this matter would wind up in the United Nations. The United Nations said yes to the Eritreans. It said yes to the Palestinians. Um, eventually, there's going to say yes to the Kashmiris, and it's going to be very difficult to say no to the Kurds, in my view. So I think I, I come to the conclusion, and I was asked to find some common ground, and I think it's not so difficult what we all agreed. I mean, at least here on the panel, and maybe also in the public, uh, in the audience, um, that um, I would say the first premise should be to, to be more sensitive to the region to respect their code of honor, 
to respect that there are other values. And I, I have lived in Africa, and I, sometimes it was really hard for me to just to accept it, but it's a, it was different. And it's not, not to have this uh, missionary seal sometimes to impose our values, we think are the right ones, uh, on other region. So this is like a, a more being more sensitive to the region and uh, craft the foreign policy according to these lines. And I think this is uh, some agreement here and um, also to um, give the people in the Arab countries uh, more possibilities to participate. Um, to forge their own fortune. And as I said, there were always bumps on the road, uh, also in Europe, to come to the state we are here. So it won't be an easy way, but uh, I think there is a way. And of course, sometimes, and this is now my own comment, it's hard to draw the line to respect the honor. And I don't want to go into uh, depths when it comes to really a violation of human rights. And I have lived in several parts of the world and it, we had always this discussion. But you know, you can't just watch it, but do you interfere? But where is the line you draw to respect the other honor canon? Or to say that's the, the red line, it's crossed, you have to interfere. So that's more a philosophical question. I thank you for your attention.